Well, hello everyone, and you join us here today, Tom and I, with a special guest, someone that you've been asking for us to come and talk to, and he is here. He's taken some time out of his very busy schedule. Hello, Teddy. How are you doing? I am doing well. Great to speak with you both. Thank you for having me. Hey, Teddy. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we've we've been spying you for a while, and we've we've seen that you've done some great things on YouTube, and we're going to talk about that. But before we do, I'd like to show you something. Do you remember this guy? <laughs> I haven't watched this video in quite some time, and there's a reason for it. It makes me cringe every time. Here we go. We're going to watch a little bit because I have to, uh, you know, if this is a bit of a tete-a-tete, -tete, I'm going to have to break down some of your barriers, put you in a weak spot, and then we can, <laughs> then we can carry on talking. I'm glad some, nobody can see my face cringing, but here we go. Here we go. What is going on, everybody? My name is Teddy Baldessar, and today we are going to be going through my watch collection. So first off, I have to address this. I understand that the watch community gets a bad rap with all the snobbery that takes place. It can come off really pretentious right now to be making a video about a watch collection. I get that, but over the last 12 months, I have absolutely developed a love, a passion, and what some would say a sickness for watches. It's probably an appropriate way to put it. Uh, but really have fallen in love with these things and I wanted to just share my journey, share what I have amassed as a collection. Of course there's been a lot of mistakes, collection is no way set in stone in any <laughs> way. I'm going to continue to iterate and make changes to it, I'm imagining consolidate in the near future. However, I wanted to share it with you guys and I am coming from oh, a man. stance that is not... <laughs> well my immediate reaction to that is, aside from a little extra facial hair between now and then, that's right. That that's a very slick performance. That is a very, very slick performance. What is your background before doing this stuff? 2017, you were just getting into watches, mm -hmm. but you were already someone who was comfortable in front of the camera. How did you get there? I don't know if it's comfortable. I'm looking at my posture there and I'm pretty hunched over. I think I called my wrist <laughs> feminine and people were calling me out in the comments. It was, it was a mess in a lot of ways, but <laughs> At that time, I, my, my background was, I had some video backgrounds. I worked in digital marketing for some time, um, and that was always an interest of mine too. Like YouTube also, just have always loved YouTube. I remember coming back home from high school, and instead of doing my homework, I'd watch YouTube videos. So I, I knew the platform quite well, and at that moment, what I really liked was seeing people's collections. I loved seeing how it was an expression of who they were, and I'm like, hey, I'm gonna throw my hat in the ring, because at that time, I always liked watches growing up, but before it really infected me in that last like the 12 to 18 months before that, where I started actually spending money. So I felt like that was a reason to say like, oh, I'm a collector now, right? Cause I'm spending more money. I'm taking this more seriously. And I wanted to just document my journey and put a video out there. But the vi video production background was definitely there from the beginning. I wouldn't say this is great, but compared to what was going on in 2017, the watch community, I mean, I don't think B-roll existed back then. <laughs> no, I don't think it did. I think it was, if, if I recall back then, it was a one take thing with a guy kind of holding a camera and a watch trying to balance the two together. Uh, so it, 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 it was a really, um, really took the industry and the community by surprise, I think. And I also think what you said at the beginning of that video still stands very much true today. Hmm. It, for me, talking to people who don't know about watches, talking about watches feels like something you don't, it's hard because you're wearing something that's worth several thousand dollars on your wrist, if not more. Um, you mentioned in the video that you'd been getting in uh, into watches over the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? So I was always into watches growing up. I mean, I had my Timex and G-Shocks, uh, but I think there's a few reasons why it happened. One is just who I am as a person. I am a very curious guy. So I feel alive when I can find something that keeps me interested. And watches were one of those things. I was just stumbling into it. I was, at that point, I was starting my professional career, and I'm, I'm like, how can I, you know, invest in myself, and how can I, you know, maybe help my, my clothes and all of this. And then I got further fascinated with watches at that point because I actually had some money to actually throw at it for the first time. And I also <laughs> was just fascinated with the history, the individual expression of it all, and just went down the uh, rabbit hole that it is and fell in love with it. And it's kept me interested at this point. I mean, there's very few things where you can say, I am learning something new every day. And I still can say that even now. So that was really my fall into it. I think the other thing that was really interesting though too is I, there was like some subliminal messages that I was getting when I was younger from my father. He's not a big watch collector at all. He was not the reason why I got into watches fully. Uh, but there was this one watch that I was um, told about. It was my great grandfather's watch. He, he emigrated from Italy 
and he's who I'm named after. I actually have a whole video on my channel about this. It's still probably one of my favorite videos, despite the views. And he, you know, came over from Italy during a time where, uh, you know, being, you know, he wanted to be an American. He, he started his family at 11 children, but of those 11 children, there's only one grandchild that was a boy from that could pass on the family name, and that was my father. And he was gifted this watch in the late 1950s from all the grandchildren. And my father was given that watch, who I'm also named after. And it became almost like this baptism for him, where he like changed his name to reflect, uh, you know, Carl Baldassar was his name. And I'm also named after my father, so Teddy's actually not my real name, as some people know that follow the channel. And I was gifted that watch after I started my career in watches. My my dad's like, hey, it's time to give you this. So it was almost this, you know, connecting the dots backwards. Also, I mean, it wasn't just one thing, as this you know typically goes. Nice. It's quite an eclectic collection you've got there, Teddy, actually, as I'm, we're watching this video. Have you still got many of those pieces? Have you, have you hung on to any of those? Some of them, yes, but not, I would say majority are passed on. Some, some are with my, I, I've gifted a lot of my watches away to people that I like too. Like I haven't just sold my watches. I actually like now see it as an opportunity to get other people interested in it. So I give my brother a couple <laughs> of watches. Um, I sold them my Rolex because I'm not that nice of a brother, but you know, I like to try to find those opportunities. Like my cousin has my Zen now. It's it's just a fun way to you know figure how you can pass that along. Oh, I like that. That's that's a nice idea. Isn't that what drug dealers do? The first bit's free. <laughs> yeah, it's a little Seiko, little taste. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it is like a drug. It is a gateway drug. It's, you're probably right. <laughs> and now the the media side of things. Is, that's your career. Yes. Am I right? Yes, in it is. That? Yes, it is. At what point did you think that was going to be viable? Well, I mean, there's two facets to it now. I mean, there's the retail side, which is how our business operates now. Um, but it was probably 2019. You know, I remember I didn't even put on AdSense in like 2018 because I'm like, oh, you can't. I mean, it's going to be it's going to be nothing. You know, you can't do anything with that. And then I turned it on. I'm like, wait, there's something <laughs> here. And, and I recognize that this just hobby could turn into a actual living. So it was probably around that time where I'm like, okay, there's some, there's a lane here. And even with this first video, I remember, and at the time, this was a lot of views. You know, you get 30,000 views with, is your first video on YouTube in like a month and a half? Mm -hmm. Like you, you recognize that there's something here. So you're the creative director of Teddy Baldassar and you are YouTube sensation. Oh boy. <laughs> Do you still have, what, what, what happened to me when I started Watch Finder was there were just piles and piles of watches everywhere and you kind of get a bit desensitized to it. You mm -hmm. say in that first collection video, you know, you got kind of obsessed, you got this sickness for watches. Do you, does that still remain? You know, you must be surrounded by watches every day. You know, you, you got, you, you're selling them, you've got a storefront, um, you're making videos every day. Do you still have that kind of like, oh, that one's kind of a little cheeky. I might have to, you know, add that to basket or something. Have you got like your eye on watches all the time? Like, from a sort of consumer point of view still? Absolutely. I mean, I look at it now two ways. And you're so right. You get desensitized because you're just surrounded by watches. If people could see me right now, I mean, I have things you know all over the table uh, at certain times <laughs> of the day. It's It gets crazy. But I do think for me, I still am interested. I mean, I still love watches. When I find something that's just for me, I've just been able to appreciate watches now on two levels. I look at it in two yeah. ways. One is, you know, for me personally, you know, what gets me interested, but I also have to almost remove that way of looking at things just because if I just do that, you'll get jaded with this. I want to sure. also look at, you know, what is just interesting? And I, I feel like as a collector, and I feel many people that watch on YouTube, and I, I hope they have the stances, even if something is not for you and it still represents a cool pursuit, whether from a design perspective or from a history perspective, we should still applaud it. And note that that, is, that should be encouraged. So that's what I also try to keep in mind is even if I can't personally enjoy something, is there still reason to be excited for other people, especially because I interact with so many people that are in their watch journey and they're, tr they're, they're yeah. excited about that, you know? And another thing I will also say is where you can find satisfaction from this hobby and not always be in the position to acquire because that is the weird like dopamine high that people have. Like I'm in, I'm in the hunt. I'm ready to buy. Where you can just yeah. sit back and actually relax and appreciate what you have in your collection. To be honest, that's where the desensi uh, being desensitized actually helped me out because I was so inundated with watches that it allowed me just to take a deep breath and say, "Hey, wait, I need. I'm looking at this the wrong way. It's not always about what's next. It's also about." 
what do you have? And what have you done with it? Mm -hmm. And how could you find enjoyment from that? So it's helped and also, if, I think, of course, like anything, if you get too many, it, it can, you know, get you desensitized. Yeah, sure. Yeah, just get a cheeky new strap for your watch and then, uh, and then all's well again, isn't it? Yeah. How have your personal tastes been, uh, been changed by those around you and the watches that they like? I have just been become way more open-minded. When you look at that early collection, a lot of it was just dress oriented. And the second collection, a lot of like vintage Omegas and small watches, things under 38 millimeters. But now I own 42 millimeter watches. I own different sizes, different styles. I went from like small, like dainty dress watches into liking a lot of like tool oriented watches and things of that sort. So I've just expanded my horizons. And I think every person should do this. They should challenge what they like and just try something new. This could be the... It can be a steak for anything, whether it's, you know, you like chicken nuggets and you, that's all you care about. You should go ahead and try something <laughs> that's completely different from that. Get out of your comfort zone, uh, regardless of what we're talking about, watches or not. Try wings. That's right. That's a great <laughs> next step. <laughs> Baby steps. Start with boneless, though, and then you can get the full bone. <laughs> I um, I once had a conversation, name drop, with uh, Wilhelm Schmidt, as you know, mm -hmm. Langer CEO, and... Um, he called me um, out of the blue. He, he managed to get my number through the contacts at, at Langer because we had done a video on a watch and he particularly enjoyed it and he wanted to call me up to say um, thank you for doing that. And if anyone's interested, we may be owned by Richemont, but we still have to go through all the same painstaking steps as anyone else to get hold of anything. Um, and uh, I had a half an hour conversation with him. Five minutes was to talk about the video and the rest of the conversation was him saying, do you know how cheap you can get an Audemars Piguet? Uh, Jules Audemars perpetual calendar at auction for. Nobody's buying them. They're so cheap. And do you know how... And uh, cost is relative, but he was he was talking about pieces that were 50,000 plus new that were 5 to 10 on the auction market. And I remember his infectiousness about that. And that's a similar kind of infectiousness that I see in your videos, Teddy. And I wonder, after all these years, how do you keep maintaining that level of enthusiasm about product when, let's face it, it can be quite a cynical industry? Sure. Again, I think you have to take a perspective outside of yourself at times. You have to look at who is this watch potentially for, if it's not for you, and just get excited about it. And also, just, I think, you find the beauty in the watches. You find the beauty in how that watch might be positioned in the marketplace. You know, what is good about it? What maybe are its shortcomings? How is it unique? You, you have to be able to remove your own understanding of watches. Because if you've handled, say, you know, a million dollar watch before, uh, you know, you, then you handle this $20 watch. I, it's, it's crazy to think that. But honestly, I, I get excited about looking at some of that because I, I, I see other people's enthusiasm as infectious. And I think partly when people watch content like this, they they like seeing somebody who's also interested in this. And that's what get, gets someone into it. It's other people's enthusiasm, even if I'm not into something, even if I'm not into something. And if somebody's talking about, like my father, he's a musician. Like I'm not a musician, but to see someone passionately talk about the guitar, I still even I don't know what's going on when he talks about pentatonic scale, I don't know what that means, but I still find <laughs> enjoyment in the fact that somebody else finds enjoyment out of that. So you have to remove yourself from what you might see that watch to be at times. Um, we were talking a little bit before about YouTube and about the way social media is working, the algorithm and stuff like that. Some pretty heavy stuff that I'm sure our audience don't want to get too far into, mm -hmm. but there's a very important thing to, to, to bring up the ever-changing platform that is YouTube. I've seen it in the past before where people have been left behind. What are you doing? What's next for Teddy in order to keep ahead of the algorithm? I, I, there's a lot of things you could do. I think one of the things for me is now with the lockdowns being over is just getting, just get out on the move a bit more, you know, just get out of the comfort zone. The one challenge though, and I, I think people need to recognize this when it comes to why and how people produce content, we are in a small niche space. If I could go ahead and make a make it feasible, you know, make a 40 minute documentary. And also I don't take any money from the brands to make this content. This is all self-funded through our store, which is I think important to mention. Mm -hmm. if, if we can, <laughs> if I'm able to do that, I would absolutely do it. But then this is what's gonna end up happening. I'm gonna sp dump tens of thousands of dollars into it and it's going to get potentially less views. It's a big risk to do that. So 
that's the challenge at times when you're dealing with this niche space, which I don't know, we were talking about it before we started rolling. What is the total amount of people in, in watches that watch YouTube oriented content monthly? I don't know, maybe five, 10, somewhere in that range, a million. I, I don't know. I don't know. So you have to be also realistic with that. But I think for me, the, it's the double edged sword of what we've been able to build with around, you know, just Teddy Baldassar is it's, there's, there's 12, I mean, there's a team working on this. And then there's also, of course, me, who's the only person on the content side. It's, it's very unique if you look around the industry where it's very much like outlets. It's very much like brands. It's in Teddy Ballstar, I suppose, as a brand. It's weird to say that. Yeah. But I think that also comes with some interesting ability to have people take things that maybe would just be seen as just, okay, it's an experience, but then have them live vicariously through my experience if I go out and about because it's more from a, a person than it is like a brand um, per se. So I, I think that's probably what a lot of what we're going to be focusing on mostly. We've, we're posting three videos a week uh, as of right now. And I think that's a, for us, a comfortable state where if I don't want to oversaturate. I want to keep a, a certain standard of quality but I think there's more upside when it comes to more out and about type of content, which for the last couple of years, it's been pretty challenging. And also where I'm based, it's increasingly challenging because there's unfortunately not a lot going on in Cleveland for, uh, you know, the watch industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Between Switzerland and Cleveland, I think yeah, there's a little bit of a difference going on there. There are. I'm just looking at your front page of your website and uh, the best sellers. And um, there's a lot of familiar watches that have been doing gangbusters lately. Mm -hmm. The Tissot PRA, the Young and Smack Spill, the uh, Khaki Field Mechanical, which is haunting me still. In your uh, your very first collection video, you talked about the snobbery of, of the hobby. And do you think that is starting to recede now? Now that we're starting to see these more sort of value pieces that are actually like really, really affordable, but really, really good for what you get. Um, do you think the interest in these sorts of value pieces increasing and, and, and there's actually like less of a chasm between kind of maybe more fashion watches and, and, and luxury watches? Do you, do you think any of that is happening? Or is that just wishful thinking on my part and actually I'm being a bit naive and um, people are still going to judge you if you wear a t so <laughs> You know, I maybe it's wishful thinking, but I prefer to be in that camp because... Honestly, a Tissot PRX is such a killer watch. If you ever handled that watch, that watch is like insane value. Yeah, the same is. with Hamilton Khaki Field. Like those watches are definitive points of value. Max Bill, some people don't like the design, but I love that design. It just speaks to me. Yeah. You know, that first video, I had a Max Bill chronoscope in that video. So I've always just loved the look of it. Sure. But I do think there probably is something to be said about because there's now so much content out there that the level of understanding of what is available to people right. has been elevated to a point where I feel that some of the, you know, what you're making a point of Tom is actually probably true is now there's more of an understanding of, okay, wait, this is, wait, this exists. Yeah. It, beforehand, I don't know if that content was even out there highlighting some of these watches to the same degree. Yeah. I think like certainly you've had a role in pioneering these brands and saying like, that these are okay. <laughs> Don't be a snob. And also, I mean, I think about it now from like a consumer base. I mean, in the last 10 years, like how much has changed in the wearable department? It's it's actually crazy. You think about the rise of just wearable electronics and how are people going to get in to watchmaking now? Yeah. I think that affordable segment is more important than ever yeah. because you need to have that gateway drug because what are these luxury brands doing outside of, that's why I thought the Omega Swatch thing was so interesting because it was like the first time a luxury brand started to incorporate that maybe younger consumer, the consumer that was not a buyer today, whether or not you like the watches or not, I'm just going to put that aside. But that's a very interesting case study to monitor, I think, for the future. Um, and I think that's also maybe a, an example of your point being true, Tom. Maybe there is something there with that. Yeah, I meant to mention the, the moon swatch in my question. Yeah, that, it, it's definitely an indicator of an appetite, I think, for <laughs> for more affordable pieces. And, uh, last question, because I appreciate we've taken up a lot of your time. And thank you very much. Oh, I'm having fun. This is great. Don't think too hard about it. Say whatever is on the tip of your tongue. You've got a few thousand dollars to spend. It's, it's a watch for someone who is like, what watch should I get for a few thousand dollars? What do you recommend? Value wise, I would look at brands at 3000 bucks. I'd look at brands like a Longines, a Tudor. I think those are probably going to give you a good compromise to quality. 
Uh, and then also with, you know, heritage, prestige, I think they'll have something there, whether you're the Tudor buyer, you have the Rolex connection, which some people might find fascinating. Uh, Longines has some of their own proprietary movements that they're working on with Etta to, to make, and I think they're well positioned, great history. I'm wearing a sector dial right now, so I, I'll, put, I'll put the, but those are some recommendations, but there's so many interesting brands. Like I'm working on a, a video of a, like a cool independent brand right now, like Louis Erard, which I think is like a really interesting, just independent yep. offering under $5,000. So it really just depends on what you like. I love Zen too. Zen is a great brand. Uh, if you wanted to go for like their U50 tegmented case, like there's so many different offerings, but I would say the safest choice is probably Longines and Tudor. And you look at the market and you know, what are the best selling brands in that segment? It seems to be like those are probably some of the safer options. Um, dear audience, uh, viewer and listener, if you ever want to know if someone is truly a watch enthusiast, ask them to pick one watch and they'll give you five. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Teddy, um, for your time. Uh, really, really good to speak to you. Uh, some fascinating insights. And I, I really look forward to having more conversations like this with you in the future, if, if, you're, if you'd be happy to join us. Absolutely. It's, all, it's a pleasure. And I didn't mention it, but I'll mention at the end what you guys have done for just watch content in general. I love your videos. I think also you paved the way for legitimizing a lot of this, like video content few years ago was not seen the same way it is now and I think you guys are a huge reason for that. Well thank you very much and in all the spirit of any kind of comment that we receive about YouTube it was very positive so I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very very much uh, and thank you all for listening as well please do like comment and subscribe and all that good stuff. Thank you Tom also for joining us and we will see you next time. Bye bye everyone. Bye. All right. <laughs>